Another round for our, uh, our speakers today. Go ahead. So uh, let me introduce uh, our, uh, our panels. We have the, the filmmakers. Uh, here on my right is uh, Dr. Professor Peter Gallison, is the Pellegrino University Professor of the History of Sciences and Physics at Harvard University. Uh, Gallison's previous film on the moral political debates over the H-bomb, the ultimate weapon, the H-bomb dilemma in uh, 2002, has been, frequently, has been shown frequently on the History Channel and is widely used in academic courses. In 1997, he was awarded the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation Fellowship and won a Pfizer Award for Image and Logic as the best book of the year in 1998. So, um, in all the way to the right, uh, professor Rob Moss is a filmmaker and professor and chair of the Department of Visual and Environmental Studies at Harvard University. Moss's The Same River Twice in 2003 uh, premiered at the Sundance Film Festival and was nominated for the 2004 Independent Spirit Award and opened theatrically at the Film Forum in New York City uh, and has numerous other credits. Uh, and then uh, uh, Managing our conversation today is Assistant Professor Bill Rankin, whose research focuses on the relationship between science and space and the territorial scale of states of globalization down to the scale of individual buildings. And he's uh, very interested in the history and uh, intellectual impact of mapping. Uh, so uh, let's welcome our panel again and, uh, and turn over to Bill. Thank you. All right, thank you, Rick. Thanks, Peter and Rob, for being here. It's great. Um, so what I want to do in our conversation here is really to sort of focus on the film as a uh, form of scholarship, as something that, uh, rather than talking about uh, learning more about radiation, hearing more about these, these historical um, events, I want to talk more about what it was like to make the film, the choices that you both faced, but thinking about what was in the film, what was out of the film, uh, and the kinds of... Uh, the kind of the hopes that you have for this kind of work um, in your careers and other careers uh, going forward. Um, so uh, one thing that I uh, want to just start with very briefly, uh, I know, at least talking to you, Peter, that this is something that you have been interested in for 10 years or more. Um, so if you could just give us a quick story of where the film came from uh, and the various kind of punctuation marks that went from uh, you know, discovering the first document to be interesting to you, uh, to bringing on more people, to making this uh, a final film. Well, Rob and I have been collaborating now for coming on 15 years. We started uh, after I made this film about the moral political arguments over whether physicists would build the hydrogen bomb. Uh, I went over to the the ES department, the art department under another name and asked to talk to the, some of the filmmakers there, and Rob uh, was one of them, and I said, would any of you like to do a course on filming science, on that would, something that would combine looking at history, philosophy, practices of science in a way that would be uh, filmable and, and organized around practice and uh, not just results or popularization. And Rob was very keen on it. He'd done, in addition to the work for which he's justly well known, uh, a sequence of films about uh, a group of uh, his friends and colleagues who uh, were river guides, and I won't try to summarize all of that, but they're remarkable films. And he, uh, he also had done some work that intersected astronomy, and so he was interested, and we started teaching a course together uh, starting in 2000 and called Filming Science, looking at how, what documentary film is and what it could be and how it might address science in an exploratory way that was not just popularization or dissemination of previously obtained results. So we made this film together, Secrecy, about the national security secrecy system that emerged out of the nuclear weapons programs and uh, governs at a very large scale, millions of people working with classified status today. Uh, and so we were very interested in that. This was before the Snowden and Assange revelations, and it was something that we were, was very much on our, our minds. And then I had done this work that you mentioned about thinking about nuclear waste and nuclear territories. Uh, we began to talk about some of the strangeness of that problem, how outscale it was to the concerns 
uh, that we normally have in politics, either in time or spatial extent. It kind of exceeded our capacities. So we started filming in that, and I'd say the big punctuation point after that, uh, there are many other things to say about the collaboration, the kind of visual styles that we've chosen to work in. Maybe Rob can say something about the role of animation uh, and other things that we've been thinking about a lot for over a decade now. But one of the big changes was Fukushima. And we started this film before the March 2011 triple disaster uh, that you all know about, you see in the, in the film. Um, but once we saw that, the, once that happened, it became increasingly clear we had to address it. And that became a, a fundamental transformation in the film when we spent time filming, as you saw, in Fukushima in uh, almost exactly two years after the accident and we were still dealing with restricted parts of the landscape and people who were trying to eke out a living in that area and how they coped with it. And that was really a, a fundamental change in the design of the film. It was then that we really saw how the film might function in its overview. Great. So I, I, uh, the, the question of animation, I think, is really uh, an interesting one. Um, and I think I wanted to bring, bring the animation into a discussion about what kind of documentary this is. Um, because obviously there's a certain level of exposition here. You have people explaining things to us. Um, there are comp concepts, both technical and not so technical, that, need, that are being, being sort of, uh, we're being asked as an audience to consider. But then there are lots of uh, places throughout the film where we're just asked to watch, where there are things that, you know, we may or may not reach the same conclusions as you, the filmmaker, our minds might wander. So there's a kind of tension between the expository mode of documentary and the kind of observational documentaries. Um, and so I wonder, maybe, maybe Rob, you want to talk about um, specifically how this relates to other kinds of films, how you see the balance between the expository, the observational, uh, and then maybe after that we can talk about the role that animation plays there in particular. But first, <laughs> Um, I just, just to take a moment to thank you all for coming, to thank Yale for inviting us. Rick, thank you. Bill, thanks for here, being here. Also, there's two people in the audience who were in the film, who we learned a lot from, whom we couldn't have made the film without their work and their inspiration. That's Wendell Bell and Ted Gordon. Just to raise your hands right there. And we're so pleased that you're here and just can't go on without acknowledging it before we continue. Um, and hopefully can we be able to be part of the conversation as well at this, this moment. Um, <clears throat> I mean, every film has a relationship between exposition and expressivity. I mean, it's just, it's not particular, and I, I don't think documentary is defined by exposition um, any more than narrative fiction films are necessarily. And, but they all have their own balance that they have to achieve in their own, creating their own identity, and that certain things have to be made clear before other things can happen. That's both true for storytelling and for expositional kinds of things. And <clears throat> so I don't, you know, it's like, it's a, it's a complicated thing. I mean, just going back to where Peter started about Fukushima, I mean, the film, the origin of the film was really um, Ted and Wendell's work. I mean, there was something about the, what being asked to create scenarios for the future, to warn the future for up to 10,000 years, not to dig someplace, to make a specific message, to have created something that's dangerous enough um, that didn't, didn't exist quite and then gets put in one place and then you have to say, um, we're responsible to the future and if we are, then how do we warn people and how do we think about that? The kind of mind-blowingness of this problem, the contending with this problem struck us as a good starting point. Um, how to make a film starting there, what that would mean. And that led us to the waste isolation pilot plant and to the idea of marking the, the, the surface at some point when they stop putting stuff underground the idea is that you put something on the, future, in, on the surface that warns people. And that idea together seemed like, well, we could film there. Um, that meant there was a certain amount of, of exposition to get through, but it also seemed like maybe that would be enough to make a film, those two things together, um, the idea of the present and the future. Um, it turned out we didn't quite have that exactly right. We thought maybe we needed to go to uh, a place where they were creating the nuclear waste that was being shipped there, and that was the Savannah River site. In the meantime, Fukushima happened, and it took us another two years to get to Fukushima. Uh, we thought we could be done, we could have sort of where they're creating it, putting underground in the future, which would make a kind of stable narrative triangle. That turned out not to be the case as well. 
Um, and once we went to Fukushima, there was something about all these other sites are about trying to keep things um, from leaking and trying to protect the future. And in Fukushima, it leaked. So it was like the future had visited us. And once the future visited us, there was some narrative completion that the wheel of the film could make a revolution and sort of turn. Um, I'll stop there, because we have much to talk about. We can get also to the animation. Yeah. Before we get to the animation, I think that I want to push on this um, observation, uh, observational quality of the film a bit more. Because um, I think one of the things that I was thinking about, when there are people talking, are they explaining what we're seeing or not? And often they, they are explaining what we're seeing. And then there are times when they aren't explaining what we're seeing. Um, one of the ones that really struck me as something that wasn't being explained was lots of scenes of people just doing their jobs. So they're underground, they've got the machines, or they're riding a truck, or they're inspecting the truck. Uh, and we're never really told what to think about these things. I'm wondering, uh, maybe both of kind of from a filmic point of view, but, but also from a scholarly point of view, what is, the, what is it that you're trying to get at with all these really uh, kind of nicely slow-paced scenes of people just doing the everyday work of getting this stuff done? I mean, there's one... I think that one of the things that we've most been after, both in the secrecy film and here, is this the tension between urgent, very material, very consequential, sometimes political, uh, not so much party political, but deeply political concerns, and the, the, an imaginative space of, that these things occupy. That secrecy is about urgent matters of national security, and it has consequences, and people's lives get chewed up in this system one way or the other with containment, uh, these are real questions that have to be dealt with. And also it means something else. In the secrecy film it meant people were also thinking about biblical or sexual secrecy and it was really striking to us that even these high officials from the NSA and CIA and interrogators and people who were caught up in the system were also thinking about these other meanings. And here, this idea of containment and thinking about the very far future and the role of imagination was for us, the, the, the fact that these were tied to something consequential and in the immediate was crucial. And those scenes that are observational, of people working in a daily way with this waste, unpacking it, receiving these huge canisters, bringing out the 55-gallon drums wrapped in this clear plastic, op you know, putting, putting them into these sections in the salt caverns, uh, people. And then Fukushima was even more so because there was a way in which, you know, when in some ways that whole sequence culminates in the Prime Minister Naoto Kan saying, you know, that he, he, he thought he, we might lose modern Japan. And, you know, th at that point, this isn't just an imaginative extension, although it's also an imaginative extension. Uh, and I, I, you know, I, I think this, this, is a, this is for us really important that these scenarios and the imagined monuments and the monuments that were made hundreds of years ago in Japan that are where we're in their future and the problem of legends and stories that occur in the Nikki Nuke scenario that, that Wendell uh, uh, had, had, had sketched out. Um, but it's also about something that really has to happen. It's a multi-billion dollar project. It you know, eliminated whole, whole towns from use for hundreds of years in Japan. That this matters. So, uh, it's that tension between mattering where you need, I think, to stop talking and see, be able to pay attention. If you're always wall-to-wall -wall words, you sometimes can't see what's in front of you, like talking on your cell phone and being not quite able to read a, even a sign above the highway. And, um, but that happens in film, too, if it's all talk and explaining. And here's, I'm talking about a cow and you see a picture of a cow, then somehow the image and the fabric and the material reality vanishes. So what are the other things? So I, oh, I actually want to ahead. respond to that briefly as well, which is um, the film has a highly speculative tone, and part of its exploration is these things that are sort of more philosophical, perhaps. If those aren't grounded in something very particular, it just kind of will float off into space. And, um, I want to just a couple of very small examples that I just, you see a film for a thousand times and you notice things. Maybe you noticed and maybe not. Um, 
There's a moment where Alison McFarlane is talking about the half-life of plutonium, and it's 24,000 years. And when she says 24,000 years, it cuts to the woman who's checking the, the truck to make sure it's safe. And it, it, and it has this beautiful rhythm. It's like, you know, um, half-life of plutonium is 24,000 years, 24,100 years. And there's a beat, and then the woman kicks the tire of the truck, and it goes thud. And I just love that. It's like, it's like this is safety. You know, this is safety for 10,000 years. We're going to kick the tires of this truck for 10,000 years. And it's such a wonderful human moment. I mean, this is just her doing her job and doing a good job of it. I actually don't know why people kick tires. It's like a 1930s, you know, um, used car where you kick the tires. I guess you, it meant something at some point, and now it's just like we just do it, and she's doing it. Um, I love that moment. Um, <laughs> There's a moment um, in the middle when we're talking about, you know, the far future and sending things to outer space. And, you know, Peter and I just loved this notion that the closest analog to talking with our own species 10,000 years in the future was speaking with aliens. Um, and that, that meant that the, the teams had people who worked for SETI and that we thought that was really interesting. And then there's these photographs. And um, when, um, uh, I'm blocking on his name, um, say it again. No, um, um, the one who, Drake? not Drake, the, the, sorry, this is ridiculous. Um, um, no, the one who, who did the, the, the architect who did the designs. Brill. Mike Brill, thank you. Um, and Mike Brill is saying, you know, one of the things is that moved him was that, you know, one of the things that shows that about this is that one of the things we're thinking about in the future is you, you know, you, 10,000 years in the future. And then it cuts to a woman in a supermarket who's, um, <laughs> this is like a bunch of grapes, and she's just eaten one of the grapes from the supermarket, and the camera sees her, and she sees the camera seeing her having just eaten the grape. She's a little bit guilty. She has a kind of little half smile on her face. All this is communicated in this little photograph that we're sending to outer space for all time to say something about what human beings are like. And, you know, there's something so beautiful and simple and complicated about what photography can do and these moments in film and these bits of observation connected to these very bit big ideas, these tiny little incremental moments. And then finally, Mr. Sasaki, as he turns into his home 200 times since he was forced out of his home, um, he turns on his left turn signal. You know, ding, 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 ding. It's like so wonderful. It's like, who is he warning? Um, but it's a kind of habit of warning. It's something about human beings. Such moments go by, you don't even notice them really. It's just something about what films are like, um, something about nonfiction can do. It's, it's an answer to your question. Yeah, that's great. I, the turn signal I thought was not only to the left, but also to the right, like going into this, just like, it's great. Um, exactly, also to the right. Yeah. So, um, uh, continuing on this, one of the things that I was, I was thinking about several sort of ways that this is responding to a certain conversation in the history of science. Um, going back many decades to questions of invisible technicians, um, who's actually doing the work of science, to more recent conversations about uh, the importance of infrastructure, of maintenance, um, those kinds of things. Um, obviously, lots of work on different forms of nuclearity these days, not just uh, the main nuclear bomb and nuclear weapons, uh, uh, reactors, that kind of stuff, but uh, nuclear activity all around the world. And so I'm wondering if you could just say a few words about how you feel like this is responding to these ongoing textual conversations uh, about nuclear issues in particular, but also the sort of the work of science. I mean, in a way, uh, both with secrecy and the first film I did on the hydrogen bomb and, uh, and, and this work, um, I've been concerned and we've been concerned together with things that are invisible. Uh, invisible because they're classified, invisible because you can't look at them without getting radiation poisoning, or invisible for different reasons. And uh, so one of the motivations for looking at think, making things visible, and this brings up also animation of different kinds that we use in the film, uh, is is, is that when things become visible, in a way they can enter into our discussions in a way that they're not otherwise accessible. Not just pedagogically, but a visceral sense for scale and weight and materiality and what's involved with them. And to see that these are real people shuttling this stuff deep half mile underground in this salt cavern, to see that they're people that have to inspect it and lower it down and x-ray it and all of this work is in a way to to bring things into the visibility and into discussability 
into our uh, ability to engage with these things as a society. And so I think that's very important. There's also just the an aesthetic or filmmaking aspect to it, that beyond just what people say, to see the work, to see the material of this stuff is very important. And then the, the flip side of that are the animations. So one of the reasons that we wanted to use, there are, two, well, there are many kinds of animation, but the two principal forms of animation are the black and white fly-throughs and sort of th three-dimensional sketches that come from the drawings, mostly by Mike Brill and his team. Um, these are landscape architects, and they had the idea that you could design forms that would communicate danger over and above any specific communication of particular bits of scientific information or origin. Now, there are also mechanisms for trying to convey those things, the periodic table and what we know about cancer and nuclear physics and so on. But these big forms were supposed to convey you, as Mike Brill says in the film, you know, you, something's not right here. You don't want to be here. And uh, those, were, those were taken from the drawings that they had made, and then we worked with uh, David Lobster, an excellent uh, an animator, who took those and then riffed off those. We had lots of discussions, and we went back and forth many times, thinking about different times of day and weather and how to, how to encounter that. And then the other form is, uh, is the graphic novel, something we'd been experimenting with in the previous film, but was much more extensive here. And we wanted to do those because rather than full scale, full motion animation, but because these sketches of the future that Ted and Wendell and others had, had designed were really just like, almost like log lines or the briefest of centeristic thinking, you know, in the legacy of Herman Kahn and other, other people who, in, war planning and war gaming, you know. A bomb goes off at an air base in Frankfurt. Uh, we don't know who, who dropped it. What happens next? You know, there, there are scenarios in that sense rather than a script sense of scenarios the French use it. So we thought that if we tried to make those into full-on imagistic animation that had full motion, three-dimensional or otherwise, uh, it would violate the spirit of this what if this flash in the dark? What if the what if the climate changed? What if it was alleged? What if and that was what we were trying. What if a train penetrated the site? What if a robot lost its operating instructions? And so we thought that the graphic novels were a better match for that and would be less committing to a style of how we imagine the future right now, the way the Matrix looks like the six months around the time it was made, instantly. Uh, you know, unless you're Kubrick and uh, one of the geniuses of the 20th century, most science fiction animation or enactments just look like the time they were made. And we wanted something else that was a little more divorced from that. So that big Peter Cooper, the graphic novelist who worked with us on those, we spent, we spent many, many months working on getting the style that we wanted. And he had ideas, we had ideas, how they should be broken apart, reassembled, how that should work. Um, so trying to cap to make a world out of all of this was you know was why this film took us almost six years to make so the other uh type of kind of uh non-imagistic thing of course is the maps um and of course i i i think about maps for for my life um and uh i i wanted to see if there's something to say about the kinds of narratives that the maps are are offering um, I have some thoughts about them, but I, that seeing them, I think they actually play a really important role in kind of concretizing this, and I wonder if, if either of you could think, of, just talk about, just briefly about what that process was like. Well, I would love to hear your interpretation. Let, let, can we start there? It's like, we hear ourselves talk about the film all the time, and uh, you had a thought about this, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, sure, so I think there's, there's a couple things. One, I was struck by uh, how uh, they are maps of the present day, and they've, they've, they've emphasized the presentness by showing the particular roads and urban areas and national boundaries that we have today. Um, and so, which I thought was an interesting choice, rather than trying to show the world, to, you know, in the kind of uh, ahistorical mode of just mountains and land cover and that kind of thing. Um, and I thought that that was, I mean, I, I didn't know if that was a, a choice that you had thought about. That was one thing that was interesting. 
The other thing that I was thinking about was uh, the, the use of the kind of the black and white and the relief, I think does to me a really great job of showing this as a physical thing you can touch landscape, right? So these aren't diagrams of political, you know, uh, pastel jigsaw puzzle shapes, right? These are mountains, and, and there's, so there's, I saw this sort of tension between this, the, the, the presentness of the cities and the roads and the borders and the kind of the rawness of this denuded, uh, almost sort of Martian emptiness of the, the physicality of it. I mean, one of the things is that the, the I, I th thank you, that was wonderful, um, to hear what we have done. Um, we worked really closely with um, Bobby Petrushko, am I pronouncing his name properly, a, a wonderful um, artist. He's an artist, he also um, does a lot of graphics, he does sound installations, he teaches at the Graduate School of Design. He was a wonderful partner in helping us imagine how the maps might be done. We had had kind of very, um, wrote maps like as a kind of stand-in for a long time and towards the end of the film it was like no clearly we've been meaning to get to this and now we need to get to this and they do different things i mean i think this idea of um having a, a a landscape that has a topography was important but there's also sometimes where it's not just the present it's uh, the evolution of something i mean when you see where the nuclear power plants began uh, you see the time scales changing and the plants growing kind of evolving over time that seemed really important. You can see when that we were building them in a kind of hurry when we slowed down, how that sort of plays. It happens in a gesture, a visual gesture. It's not a, it doesn't stop everything and announce something. It's part of the kind of ongoingness. And it has a kind of, you can read it and experience it as well as understand it in a way that it had to have all of those things at play at once. Otherwise, you know, maps like that can be the death of cinema. Um, and we hoped that it, it wasn't. So, I agree that it has those things, and they mean different things when you cut back to them, because they're a visual reference to something that you've seen, you understand in a certain way, and then it changes each time. It means something slightly different each time. And that difference also keeps your interest, because you have to read it again. It's not like you're being told the same thing again in the same way. Uh, great, so I wanna um, uh, sort of switch gears a little bit and talk about some of the major choices that you're facing here in terms of figuring out what's in, what's out. Um, how do you get the people to, that are going to tell this, do this story for you? Um, and, or how do you maybe choose between seeing people as telling the story for you and looking for primary sources to understand what's actually going on? Um, so one of the ones that, uh, to start with, um, so there's no Chernobyl, there's no Three Mile Island, um, there's no uh, nuclear mining in Africa, there's no you know, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Um, how, do, how do you sort of decide it's just, it is these three things? You talked about it briefly before. Um, but I, how do you sort of have either the restraint or the, how do you know when, the, the, when you've got all the pieces and you need no more pieces? You know, one of the things that um, is very different, at least the way we think of film and the way we think of written work, is that in a written work you could say, you know, there are five major countries that are mining and you know there's the central Canada, Australia, Colorado Plateau in the United States, there's what when it began the, was the Belgian Congo, there's you know and then that's fine. That's these lists and even typographically, you know, section 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, 2.4, 2.5 you can see at a glance what's going on. In a film, that kind of encyclopedism is just unbearable. It's tedious and you don't want to see it. And it's not what, it's not what films do well. You, know, it's, it's a, you can have a film with chapters. There are all sorts of crutches that can allow you to imitate a written style, but it's like, you know, can you build a house without a hammer? Yeah, you probably could, but why would you do that? And that's not what, hammers do that well. And so with Chernobyl, we did have a piece in about Chernobyl, and we actually found some pretty good archival material that we liked about it. But Fukushima was in our immediate present. We were able to film people trying to cope in the immediate aftermath uh, of, the, of the event. Now, Auto Khan was willing to talk. I mean, we could, we could get at it. I mean, it was hard for us. Neither of us speak Japanese. So I mean, there were challenges of filming in a radiation zone in a language we don't know. But, the, but, but it, it was in our world. And I think that you know, eventually we just decided that's not, we're gonna leave out Chernobyl. That in a way, Fukushima is gonna stand in for the loss of containment. And we could, we'll go deeper into that. 
And it's true. There, you know, there are books about all the accidents that have happened. And there are even a couple of films that try to go through them all. But it doesn't, you sacrifice the, spec the specificity of what film can do, of being able to talk to the cattle handler uh, in outside of Fukushima and the young woman who's trying to keep her house from falling down and the rodents from taking over and keeping a garden going and she doesn't know if she's going to come back and the older man who's living in this place can't bear to leave it for more than 48 hours but can't really live there either. And that's part of what we want to do. You would have to get rid of that and then retreat to a repertorial white paper, uh, which we didn't want, you know, that, so that was, and many, many things in the film are like that. You know, you, you know, Hanford in Washington State is another big weapons laboratory, very much doing the same job as Savannah River. Hanford has been actually treated more often in the literature and in, in, in films. Um, and Savannah River, we also were just fascinated by this ecological wonderland that had the highest density of biodiversity and yet was the most contaminated site in the continental United States. So we made choices like that. Savannah River, not any of the 90 or so other sites, not the other weapons sites, not Los Alamos, not Hanford, not uh, uh, the places where the weapons are assembled, not Texas where the, they're disassembled, and so on. So we made the, we had, we had to choose. And film, you know, one of the things that's really striking in a film, if you take the words in a film and you printed them out, it's a couple of, it's the equivalent of a couple of pages. Although we tend to think of a film as analogous to a book, it's not in terms of words. In other ways, it creates its world along other dimensions in visual and sound, auditory and sound design and music. And we can talk about some of those other things, but it's if you just, even if you chattered the whole way through, which would be unbearable, uh, it, it's few words. It's a 90, you know. And so, so I think that you have to be enormously selective and elliptical sometimes if you want to elicit, bring people into a world, which is our overriding ambition, is to make something where you can inhabit it. So I think this gets to my, my next question. Um, this maybe speaks to also broader questions about how the film was actually made, how you all collaborated, all the other army of people that we saw, their names at the end. Um, what are the voices that were the hardest to find? Um, either literally or you just thought narratively there was something missing and you had to go find out what that was that was missing. How did you find this amazing pastor uh, in Georgia? Uh, how did you get the Prime Minister of Japan, former Prime Minister of Japan to talk to you? Um, but especially, what are, the, what are the ways, what was sort of the pieces that really were the hardest to fall into place in terms of just getting the people together in the conversation? Well, I'm going to answer it in a slightly different way, um, which is, what did we film when we went to Japan? I mean, what did we actually get that it's, it's a, we knew we needed that, but you know, we were, had to figure out what to shoot from a very long distance once we were there, we're filming in another language, and it, we got all this material that's actually quite amazing, and most of it is not in the movie. Um, and when we tried to make that material um, play in a sort of complex way, give more voice, tell, tell the stories more in depth, um, to go into detail of what it meant, like all kinds of scenes that aren't in, then there was a way in which it's a voice that had to enter the film, but if it entered too strongly, it, it was like we were trafficking in and sort of catastrophe, uh, a kind of catastrophe genre. And there was something unseemly about it. And it seemed to exceed what the film needed. And it took us a year of editing to kind of find the right weight of the Japanese material and what those characters could do, how far we could go, how it has a kind of emotional, but a lot of it is like, like stepped back so that you can, it's just gestures and a couple of things, a few things happen. Um, you know, we're not sort of pushing on it emotionally too much. I think that gave it a more emotional resonance. I think more of the story could kind of creep into those images. Um, we had, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a bit of an answer to your question. And it was really a question of getting it and then cutting it back so that it could live in the film and not swamp the film and not suggest that we were 
you know, manipulating this footage for the ends of the film and giving them a kind of distance, a little bit of distance and a little bit of space so that we weren't kind of, um, you know, making hay over their misery. You know, I think that, I think it's, it's totally right. I mean, I think cutting back was really essential. And a lot of things that didn't work started to work when there was less of it. Uh, but we filmed on boats for fishermen. We filmed in places where they were testing fish. We, we, fil we, we talked to workers who were afraid of the TEPCO would find out they were talking to us, sort of meeting them in parking lots. And, and you know, they would tell us amazing stories, but it, it, we, we weren't trying to make a pro-nuclear nuclear versus anti-nuclear film. We didn't want the whole, I mean, I'd say the, that was one of our big goals from pretty early on was instead of saying, okay, here's pro, here's anti, we fall on the side of anti or limited or what, I mean, it wasn't trying to be that. It was trying to say, in the world already, whether we like it or not, this is the legacy of more than half a century of nuclear weapons and power production. What are we going to do? It's an obligatory problem with no simple answer. Um, you know, Kant began his critique of pure reason by saying there's certain questions which we can neither answer nor, nor avoid. And that's the kind of thing which we tend to, we tend to be interested in those, in both in secrecy and here and other things, is you know, what, not questions where like, here's a real problem and if you only sign a petition or join a church group or you know, protest in this way or get your company to do this, then it'll be solved. We don't think it's like that. We're choosing among very difficult alternatives, none of which are perfect. You know, that we probably end up thinking it's probably better to bury this waste than to leave it on the surface, but as you can see, it sometimes it leaks. That's not great, but it's not like, you, 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 no one's giving it, you can't send it to the sun, you can't bury it underground, in, in, in the ocean, you can't, uh, you know, I mean, pe people want a magic solution. There's no magic, as Allison says in the film. So I think we were trying to sort of say, if you're, in the real world that we live in, where, where are we pushed? And we're pushed to some pretty strange places, thinking about talking with aliens and political dominion. The maps are also there to show the extent that this is, doesn't obey national boundaries and moves around unpredictably with the wind and the water. And, uh, so it's, um, I, you know, we wanted to inhabit this world and to see people living among the waste, and, which we all are to a certain extent, and what are we gonna do about it? So the last question I have um, before I open it up, um, kind of uh, what seems to me the most uh, satisfying um, uh, sort of form of restraint that I saw in the film, we never figure out, we never learn what happened with this committee. We never know what the recommendations were. We never know what the marker system was or is or will be. And I actually don't want you to tell me if there even is an answer. But was that a difficult decision for you as filmmakers to figure out how much of that to close off on how much of that to leave open? Um, and do you, sort of, how do you make a decision about how do you not tell us the resolution of the central material of the film? Well, we have people in the room who sort of know this in a more intimate way than we do. Um, it's an ongoing decision. I mean, the waste isolation pilot plant isn't closed. Uh, they did come up with recommendations, but it's an evolving set of recommendations. Um, you know, there were lots of scenarios about what might happen, how there might be inadvertent intrusion into the waste site. Not one of them involved terrorism. It's not that long ago. That was like at the top of the list. I mean, the world changes and, you know, materials change and what's possible and how people are imagining this. There'll be some arbitrary moment in the future when it has to be marked and they'll have to figure that out. And there is something in place now about how they're thinking about it, but it's an evolving thing and it seemed to put a lid on it, seemed to miss the point in a way. Um, I'm, trying not to answer your question. Um, um, <laughs> um, I also wanted to come back to something you said, this being the end of this part of the conversation, but, and just to pose the question is, can filmmaking be scholarship? I think that's a really interesting question. It's an open question. Um, can filmmaking be scholarship um, at a level beyond the topic of the film? In other words, can films that don't have topics that you can then talk about What's nice is that you're not, we're not moving in that direction to talk about the kind of content quite in the same way. But it would be easy to kind of move this film into the idea of content and then therefore scholarship. And I think that's a mistake. I think that um, if you don't engage the filmmaking, if you don't 
um, think about it in a much broader way. If it doesn't live as a film as well as a topic, then I think it can't possibly even be considered scholarship. It also asks the question, if it can be scholarship, is every film scholarship then? Or if every mill by, made by people who teach in the academy scholarship by virtue of our, you know, I, and these are, I think, live and interesting questions. Um, can it extend to art forms besides film? Like if you made an installation, is that scholarship? Could it be? Um, it's worth thinking about. It's like there's a new director of the Harvard Art Museums, and, and one of the things we were talking about is like, could you make an exhibit that's about art as scholarship, or even just exploring the question? How do we even begin to think about it? I think thinking about it is the first step, and, like, and not to assume the answers. I think to take this as a kind of serious and open question, and it's totally fascinating. And it's also like a great opportunity. There is something, on the other hand, about people bringing their disciplinary interests into the art world. That that's a fantastic opportunity. It's not that it has to be. You know, I'm a filmmaker. It doesn't have to be a particular discipline. But there is an opportunity in the academy when people bring their disciplinary ex expertise and then open it up to another way of communicating that or engaging with it in some kind of way and what's revealed when you do that. Pretty interesting. Great. Well, I, I, I definitely want to continue talking about that. But um, for the next 20 minutes or so, let's, um, let's have questions from, from all of you. All right, thanks so much. Um, back to animation for just a second. Um, I have to know, oh, sure. I have to know more about Nikki Nuke <laughs> or the Nikki Nuke land that was kind of uh, in development. Um, and that actually reminded me, obviously, of Disney. And um, I guess that's, that's where my question is coming from. Um, I was wondering, um, I, I saw Disney is definitely kind of linking both the, the content of your film, but also possibly the method as well. So we saw the links to, um, you know, Nikki Nuclan, definitely based on Mickey Mouse. It goes back to silent films with uh, Steamboat Willie, but also fantastic at kind of conveying danger. Um, so we can think of our villains, we can think of the dangerous places. Um, so I saw those links, um, but I wanted to ask about how Disney, um, as an animator, might have shaped your method of approaching um, the film. I know that there's also links to propaganda and his health um, videos as well, but um, through using animation, um, how did you see him as a model? I'd like to add, Wendell, would you, would you like to talk a little bit about the kinds of characters you had in mind when you thought about Nicky Nuke? Uh, I should say that uh, I was a member of a team of four, of four people and uh, what we came up with was not just my work, but Ted Gordon, who, who headed the team and the two other people on the team. But uh, I think in the case of Nicky Nuke, we had uh, Smokey Bear in mind. Uh, for years, Smokey Bear warned us about forest fires. And uh, I think it's been through three generations now Smoky Bear is, is still there, at least for us who grew up in the West. And uh, Nicky Nuke, I thought, could be like Smokey the Bear, except his job would be to warn us about where nuclear waste is. And uh, I, that was a gratuitous scenario. We were asked to, by Sandia National Labs, to write scenarios that resulted in releasing the radioactivity. But uh, Ted and I and others on our team, we thought we'd at least have one scenario that showed that everything stayed as it should be and there was no radiation and it was all because of the activity of Nikki Nuke telling us, no, don't go there, don't go there. And I can imagine just like Smokey the Bear, Nicky Nuke could become something that we carried around in our imaginations that could last for generations. Ted, Ted do you, you, do you have? One, one of you said something about something about point scenarios. Didn't use that term, but 
When we were instructed by Sandia on, on what they expected to see in the scenario component, they, and they had an overall design which we followed. But we broke into four separate groups. Each group took their own technique. But basically what people wrote um, was, were, were point scenarios. I mean, we had to focus on something. And each scenario is different. The tunnel between Houston and Los Angeles was one of the scenarios. And we imagined a, a big boring machine would, uh, would come along and be able to make that tunnel. And sure enough, the site was right in the middle of that line that we drew. But each of these was a, a very poor indication of what the future might be. None of the scenarios have high probability. So inevitably, we, we ended by saying we've missed the real point. The future is going to be different than anything we created. This is a good start, and maybe we've, maybe we've circled, circled it so that if someone has this in mind when they design the warning system, uh, by luck, it will do warning in whatever world turns out to really be the case. Now, the field of futures research has moved on since then, as you might imagine, and now not just point scenarios, but hundreds of thousands of scenarios expressed in different ways, and somewhere in that panorama of possibilities, done with big machines, obviously, lies the real world, so we start having a better feel for policy leading, leading us to uh, make changes that move us in a direction that we would find favorable. Today we would ask the question, how does the world have to change in order for us to avoid having this problem? Not what the problem might be, not what was the cause of it, but what should we be doing now? And in a, in a strange twist of fate, my recent research has been in uh, terrorism. And I, if I had to do it over again, I'd stress that scenario. Look at, look at what, what's out there, uh, waiting, waiting to be tapped, and our inability to find those who would, who would do us damage. So, but I do want to say, guys, great film. Good job. Excellent. Nice film. And, and the, the, part, the part of it that I found particularly touching were those human parts, the man going back to his house, the cowboy touching the nose of the cow. You know, this was his friend, and he was going to be sacrificed. Uh, so good job. Thanks. Thank you. You know, um, one of the things that I found fascinating is that in that Nicky Nuke scenario, it seemed you know, wildly speculative. You would have this museum slash entertainment center and it would serve as a memorialization and warning. And in Kiev, there's a museum about the Chernobyl disaster that's immensely popular. It was until Ukraine came apart at the seams and was an international destination and it's a combination of entertainment and instruction. And there's talk about building one in Fukushima that would be a combination entertainment center memorial and warning. So in a way, the things that seem sort of most wildly out there uh, sometimes come to pass. Uh, and in terms of the models, uh, and, you know, Wendell, you once in one of our many conversations about this said that you also had in mind the Dilbert character who when you flew in the, uh, in, uh, in the Navy at the end of World War II would warn you about all the stupid things that he would do that would warn you to make sure you put down your landing gear, and I went and I dug up all those old films, because uh, I didn't know them, and you know, that Dilbert would forget to lo lower his landing gear, or he'd forget to secure his machine gun and end up strafing the cafeteria at his home base, and he, one disaster after another, and they were instructional. Um, so uh, then we found it so fascinating in the Fukushima, in the, in the Japanese section, where we found this legend of uh, called Inamora no Hai, this warning where this storyboard storyteller would come to each town and show you these sequence of boards about the man who saved his town in the 1850s in Japan by setting the town's rice supply on fire and then everybody came to put it out with buckets of water and they were rescued from the impending tsunami which he, the town leader, was able to foretell because he saw the tide going out in the wrong way. And, uh, and so a lot of these cross connections between Japan, the Japanese story, where we are in the future, trying to be warned by what ha 
was done 100, 200, 300 years ago, and what we're trying to do to warn our future seemed to us one of the fascinating parts of intersection. Hi. Um, so uh, assuming for the moment that film can be a form of scholarship and one that, you know, as you've said, does different things from a book, um, it, you know, might reach different audiences, make them think about issues in a different way. Uh, maybe the same can be said of, like, popular books published with a trade press or Jezebel articles or, you know, podcasts, whatever format you like. Um, how can we uh, make space for scholars to do more of that kind of scholarship? Um, I mean, you know, you said it took about the same, it took like six years, like that's how long it takes to write a history book, and I don't think it's a coincidence that you did this after you have tenure. Um, I'm a PhD student here, I don't think I could make this for my dissertation. I got my bachelor's from your department and I tried to get permission to do like a long form journalism thesis and I, they wouldn't let me. Um, because that wasn't, that's not scholarship. Scholarship is a book that 10 people read. Um, so I'm wondering if you could uh, discuss a little bit what I could do to uh, find a way to maybe make a different kind of scholarship or what you all could do to also make that option available to people like me. Hey, what I did when I was an untenured professor at Stanford is I didn't tell my senior colleagues I was making a film. But did you have a time turner? Like, how do you do bo both things? <laughs> Surreptitiously. Did you sleep? No, I'm, I mean, I'm I serious, sleep. like, I don't know, it's just like, oh, it's fine, like, just don't have loved ones, like, just make everything. Doesn't seem feasible, I don't know. It took a know. long time, it took 15 years, and I, and I did it without telling people, but, yeah, no, I think that, the, in general, you know, one of the things that I'm, often comes up, in, when I talk about this in universities, is people will say, can you do a film instead of a PhD thesis? And there are some places, there are some places that give PhDs in art. I actually would not recommend doing that. I would rather, because I think, so now I'm, we're just at the professional advice columnist here, but I, in placing students, um, I think it's been an enormous advantage to students that have done some filmmaking in addition to their written work, but if they have no written, major written work and they're trying to get a job outside of an art department, then uh, it's very difficult. So I think that you know it doesn't have to be a feature-length film that you do. It could be a, in our course, our students make seven-minute films, um, and there you know there's no law that says that the only kind of filmmaking is long form. Uh, so it may be that in the in in the process of learning to to, to add this to your you know, now add this arrow to your quiver. Uh, it, it may be that it's, it, that's other short, shorter forms of visual exposition or auditory or audio exposition or other kinds of development may be better uh, than trying to make something that's full length. So I think that the world is changing. We, we, we're used, you know, we have a generation now, several generations who use visual sources in ways that's one of the main ways that they learn things, whether it's looking on YouTube for something or finding a you know, they have a kind of access to a world of, of not just of films, but of instruction, of engagement, of amateur, you know, I, iPhone shots. We have archives of, you know, about Fukushima, for example, of tens of thousands of tweets and ar archived iPhone images and movies. Uh, it's a different world of sources that allow different kinds of work to be done in sociology and history in anthropology, in ethnography, um, in history of science, and I think that, but we're, we're still at a transitional moment, I think, and I wouldn't, I, in good faith, recommend to somebody that they, if you want a job eventually, it depends why you're doing your advanced degree, but if you're doing your advanced degree in order to eventually teach in one of those kind of departments, I wouldn't think that it would be good to forego writing a thesis. But I think there are ways to deal with the visual in ways that are tractable in the real-time allocation that you have in the five years of graduate school or whatever you spend doing your PhD. Pierre. Yeah. yeah, just quick, just briefly, there there is a, and Peter was one of the inventors of this and I'm on the committee, but there is um, a thing called critical media practice. It's what we call a secondary field. It's like a minor for the graduate program in which there's a series of courses and importantly a capstone experience in which you can make something in addition to your writing. Uh, but you get recognized for this. 
and you're part of a community of makers thinking about things. It's not like the film version of your thesis, but there's some engagement with some, some visual or oral uh, work. Um, you can take some courses, you work with people, you have an advisor. Some extraordinary work has come out of this, really quite extraordinary. And it has helped people get work in their fields because they've got this extra thing and they have the work to show it. Um, I don't know if Yale does anything like this. I've, I've been here other times and this has been discussed. It's a wonderful opportunity for scholarship by another name, uh, for a certain different kind of scholarship to take place and to be recognized for it so it's not 15 years covertly, no life. Uh, it's part of it, and it's quite wonderful. Priya. Okay, so um, <clears throat> very, very interesting, sobering, but um, I was intrigued by the fact that perhaps it was intentional that you guys do not reveal a moral position on nuclear power, on nuclear energy. How hard was it to make the film without actually addressing the question of whether this is a way forward or not? Um, was that really challenging, or did it just? It is. I mean, there are, there is a there are dozens of films that are pro and anti nuclear power. Nuclear power is the only thing that's going to save us from global warming. Nuclear is is going to lead us to global annihilation and nuclear winter. And as soon as you sort of start in that, it's a kind of you know swamp that I mean it takes over the whole film. And so we began. We we formulated a way of thinking about this, which is. If you, make, if you engage with nuclear power and nuclear weapons, this is a problem that you will have to resolve. So, and for those countries like the United States that have 50, 60 years of this, um, even if you stopped and didn't produce another watt of electricity and, uh, or another decal on a nuclear bomb, you would still have to deal with tens of thousands of tons of nuclear waste and million gallon tanks. There are 177 of them in Hanford and 50 of them in, in, in Savannah Riverside. I mean, it's like the size of the Capitol Dome upside down filled with this highly radioactive sludge. And that's, that's not going to go, well, we hope it's not going to go anywhere, but it, it's not, it, it's, we need to deal with it. It's a, it's a real threat. Uh, it's probably the biggest single uh, radioactive threat. So we thought that in a way, to take it out of this name-calling, stone-throwing, pro-anti-nuclear uh, uh, battle and to say, here's a problem that we have, other nations will have too if they engage in this work, and then how are, that we need to think that along with the nuclear, that the back side of the nuclear, the distal side of nuclear things is, is, has attracted much less attention, either in the broader cultural imaginary where nuclear war is constantly there in military circles, constantly talking about nuclear exchanges and city trading and tactical nuclear weapons and smaller, lighter, bigger weapons. Um, that that in, in historical terms, political science departments, sociologists, there are lots and lots of, of our scholarship is invested in the multi-trillion dollar enterprise of building nuclear weapons and nuclear power plants, but much less about what this means for you know, no one wants to talk about taking out the trash at the end of the party. It's the party that interests people. And, and so we wanted to, we thought there was something actually amazingly philosophically, morally, politically interesting about this stuff that is like, is the distaff side, the back end of this fuel cycle. And just quickly, Prime Minister Khan feared that one fuel pool, one fuel pool catching fire might end Japan as he knew it. He experienced this as the prime minister. Um, you know, one barrel exploded underground, and the numbers now, it's like at, at whip, and it's, you know, at the time we finished the film, the number was conservatively at about $300 million for the cleanup. It's still closed. Um, it's probably now at five or $600 million. One barrel exploded. And it exploded because they mixed up the kitty litter because somebody wrote down a, um, organic instead of uh, an inorganic. It's like anorganic as opposed to inorganic. And the organic created this kind of bomb, and it blew up, and that blowing up shut this place $600 million later. We don't make a point of the film. I would say that what it's not like pro or con. What we didn't do, and we worked hard not to do, was to um, press the sort of 
peddle of fear too hard, that everything nuclear makes everybody so afraid. And then once you're afraid, you're not really thinking about anything. We wanted people to engage with the ideas. And then you come up with your own idea about it, the end of it. I mean, we, we think you should have your own ideas about it. But there are things in the film that make nuclear complicated and a little scary, even though we're not pressing the fear button. And that is where we, we meant to be restrained about that. Not so much about a point of view, but not trafficking the fear in the same way we weren't trafficking or trying not to in the emotion in Fukushima. Yeah, uh, thank you. It, it, it is a wonderful film. And uh, I think, actually, it's ethically uh, very rich and complex by refusing to take that position. I, I just want to briefly make a small plug going back to the previous discussion about uh, scholarship and, and uh, PhD students. Uh, we, we have something that's maybe a little more under the radar and not as developed as you at Harvard, but I, I do teach a year-long course documentary film workshop, and uh, this, uh, this year there's been about 15 students in the course, and five of them are PhD students, five are master's students, and five are seniors doing senior projects. So that's a place where, particularly on the graduate level, it's designed for students to do a documentary as a form of scholarship. It's not a kind of escape from academic life or a substitute for, for writing uh, papers or dissertations, but it is a, a way of complementing it. So I throw that out to people. Also, just to continue the plug, um, there's a new public humanities program here. There's an MA. There's work to make it a PhD program. I'm the co-acting co-chair of it. And documentary is one of the five fields, including digital humanities, um, documentary. Um, I, I, can't, I can't say what the other three are right now. But this is, this is graduate work for graduate degrees doing this kind of project and doing it with, for um, under the auspices of public humanities. Um, and it's also working with the Smithsonian Institution. So dig, which was just announced, I think, in the, in the paper. So dig deeper if you want to do this. Um, um, nobody's saying you can do it instead of the text-based academic work, but nobody is saying you can't do it. Maybe as a way to, to oh, one, one, one more question, Johnny? Great. Um, hi, thanks. No, no plug. Um, I, I was curious about the sound in the documentary, and I was really struck. I mean, the only time I've seen sort of inside a, a salt mine of this kind is a documentary called Our Daily Bread, a German documentary, which specifically takes sort of no moral position on food production, but has no music and no voiceover. And I was curious about your decisions to actually have um, A, music, and B, people talking in some way, um, partly because that mode of sort of explanation or the hermeneutic problem that you're dealing with seems to be in some sense short-circuited by having people on hand to sort of explain or to act as the kind of uh, the caption or the anchor, let's say, to the scenes we're seeing. Um, and secondly, I wondered about the time of the documentary, because, you know, as we all know, if you take a minute silence for something, time seems to move very differently from, you know, if you have sort of idle talk or chatter or something like this. Um, so I wondered what the decisions were in terms of sort of occupying the space and therefore the time and therefore the sort of hermeneutic problem um, through the soundtrack of the film. Thanks. Um, so we worked, uh, the sort of layers of sound are, uh, some of it is observational sound, I mean, just in, present in, in these spaces and as, um, Bill was saying before, I mean, sometimes it's just, we just let that play and cut back on sound. We do want to raise certain philosophical issues about consent and, and understanding, you know, some fairly abstract ideas, like what Ted says and Ted Gordon says in the film about the purpose of these scenarios, what they, they weren't aiming to, to replicate or to pre-replicate uh, an actualized future, but to give a kind of boundary of possibilities. Um, that's th those moments. So some moments are about that. Sometimes it's somebody in their experience of, you know, like the woman going back for the first time to the Mrs. Uh, S, I call her, going back to her, uh, the restaurant where she had spent this time with her friends and opens it up and, you know, it stinks from the tuna that's rotting in the refrigerator. Um, and 
so there's a mix, there's th those kind of sounds. Then there's, then there's a, there's sound design. We worked with a very an enormously uh, talented sound designer, Carl Anderson, and he working on, you know, sometimes ve very small things, at least they seem small, but where they can be evocative in an extraordinary way uh, in, you know, sometimes it's quasi-realistic, like the dirt being pushed, covering up the old boxes of waste. That was a silent film, uh, or that sequence was silence. And sometimes it's much more abstract, uh, fragments of sound, of m mechanical or, or, or even tones. Um, and then designing that in relationship with the music, um, we started out with, we worked, our main composer is Mike Einziger, who's a lead guitarist uh, and composer for Incubus and a former student of mine. Uh, so uh, he kindly uh, contributed uh, some wonderful music to this. And then he, there were he two. He got a name minus. He, he, he worked for a name minus, I That's suppose. right. <laughs> we could never <laughs> afford it him otherwise, as you can imagine. Um, but then there were two other, Tristeza and Sanford Charles, uh, uh, other music. We, we spent a lot of time cutting back the music to, you know, we found oftentimes at the points of emotional intensity that it's better to have zero music. Um, and that one of the things that I think we've come, you know, working together over a long, over now, long time, is we you know we, 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 if you, if you push, if you try to exaggerate an emotion by musically orchestrating it, it's less emotional. It's actually just pisses you off, or at least it pisses us off. So I think that learning to figure out what those moments are where the music can carry something, or like in outer space, Mike Einziger's piece that goes with the Voyager spacecraft heading off into infinity, uh, that was a place where we felt the music did a lot. Uh, whereas if you tried to put it underneath Prime Minister Khan speaking about potentially losing Japan, it was catastrophic. I mean, it didn't, it, it, it made it weak. So, um, and then the music and the sound design have to go together, and that, and the found sound. So, I mean, the, the experiential sound. So you have these layers of sound, and a, there's a tremendous amount of work getting these very small things, but sound, a tiny bit of sound can give you a, a feeling of volume, just spatial volume or extent, um, a small, um, in, 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 in amazing ways. It's actually it's astonishing, I think constantly astonishing to us how much a small sound change shifted the affective and cognitive content of a scene. Okay, with that, um, my own uh, quasi-plug response to Chelsea's thing, I think that one of the ways to make the scholarship really stick is to have these kind of conversations, to develop a vocabulary, to have a public conversation about them, and I think this is a great one, so thank you all for being part of it. Thank uh, Peter and Rob again. And